badger. Well known, but rarely seen. Now, if you do find a quiet spot where they are undisturbed, you may spot them venturing from their sets in the late evening. But until recently, we've really known very little about them. Why? Well, perhaps because they're nocturnal and they're very wary of us. The slightest strange smell or sound and they will scurry back to their sets unseen. A major research project involving the Department of Agriculture and the National Parks and Wildlife Service began four years ago. Badgers are being fitted with radio collars and their movements tracked on a scale never before undertaken in Ireland. Now it's known rather unromantically as the Wicklow N11 Badger Study. It's early April and the start of three weeks of badger catching. A series of traps were baited last night and there are seven badgers awaiting us today. It's real typical mixed farming landscape. What, sheep, cattle, tillage, horses too? Yeah, we've got stud farms and racing stables. An adult female is the first target this morning and vet Teresa McWhite wants to release her as soon as she can. There she is. Oh, she's got a collar. She's got a collar, so that means we're going to be able to tell who she is now if we scan her. Okay. She's lactating. I think she is. Okay. 4845. Do you know who that is? I think it might be Ivy. She's not too happy. She wants to get back to her cubs. So we'll do what we have to do with Ivy very quickly now. need to give her a little bit of peace and quiet now so yes. she goes to sleep. Okay. I think many of us grew up with stories about how dangerous and vicious badgers were. All complete and utter nonsense. The truth is something quite different. Some of them are a little bit nervous. Some of them might growl or whatever. But there is absolutely no aggression towards us. They're really just trying to defend their own little space and saying, you know, I'm here, but I don't want you coming any closer. But there's no aggression towards us whatsoever. And, you know, we've, we've dealt with hundreds and hundreds of badgers at this stage, and they're not an aggressive animal. Um, we've known Ivy from the time that she was a juvenile. So we caught her in sep September of the year she was born. So that was about four years ago. So she's a four-year-old female. This is probably her second litter of cubs that she has. Okay. So Ivy's on about her third collar. So we know an awful lot about her life. And because we have six months of what she's doing at certain times of the night, that gives you a really good picture of the range of her territory. It looks like they're ready to take her out. Huh? Think yeah. she's gone to sleep? Yeah. She's lactating all right. She's in great body order too. Loads of body fat, which is great. She's going to need that for those cubs. Now Ivy's cubs will be hidden underground in a set close by, and she'll be back with them soon. She has her blood taken and a full medical checkup. Those teeth look pretty good, Teresa. They're really good teeth for a badger of her age. Ends of the canines are chipped, but that's really, really common. There's very little wear on her upper and lower incisors and her oh, yeah. molars and premolars are really good. And she's in perfect condition. She's, she's one of the badgers that we took DNA from. We actually know her parentage and we know her siblings, so it makes her really, really interesting. And we'll just have a quick listen to her chest. And that's nice and clear. Ivy was last trapped in the autumn, so it's time for her collar to be replaced by another vet, Peter Marr. I bet these collars are pretty expensive. They're very expensive collars, but they, the badgers don't really look after them very well. They, they swim with them and they bash them against things and they chew them and they eat them and they, they do all sorts of things. But this is a GPS unit here. Yes. So it picks up a GSM signal and then sends us a text message every night as to where the badger has been. So we know wow. all the time. So they really are very good. 
the scent of signals now, hopefully for the next six to eight months. And I'm going to just trim this extra bit off here now, and especially because we know she has cubs. We don't want them to be uh, damaged by any sharp bits on this either. So. Now the dye just signals that she's been trapped this season, so she can be released straight away if she's caught again. They don't seem to fear the traps because even the badgers that we recapture, we don't anaesthetize them before we let them out again. And they're quite happy to go into the cage the following day as well. So it's I think it's the reward in the cage more than makes up for, you know, the experience. She's gonna wake up soon? In about 15 minutes probably. 15 minutes? Yeah. We just prop it open with a stone so that she can see daylight and she knows all she has to do is push the flap. Well, that was incredibly fast and efficient. I thought it was going to take you a lot longer. There's a real sense of camaraderie amongst the team. The kind that comes when people work hard together. Now, they meet up for three weeks twice a year in spring and autumn. Today they're hoping to retrap some old friends but hope to make some new ones too. Both are equally valuable. The next badger is one they haven't met before. Once she's asleep it's time for her to get a unique identity. The study group now has its latest member. So they get a number and a name. Have you got a name for this one yet? No. Would you like to choose? Ooh. <laughs> so what do we know about this badger? See, I need to know something about its history in order to name it. She was born last year. Okay. So she's a yearling. Yeah. Female. And that's about all we know. She reminds me somehow of an Olivia. <laughs> I'm not quite sure why. <laughs> so I think we might go for Olivia. Would that be all right? That's all right. Yeah. Olivia is so much better than 7524. Isn't it, you see? Yeah. <laughs> but this one is a little bit too light to take a collar. That's right, yeah. They need to be over 8 kilos. And this one, I think, is just um, under the 8 kilo mark. So You must get attached to these individuals over the years, particularly the ones that you recapture. You do. You start learning their personalities because they are all different. You know, we watch their movements throughout the year as well. So... That kind of brings us into their world. And, um, yeah, we do get attached to them. Being so close to a wild badger like this in daylight is really a unique experience. It's a great opportunity to examine their features. See, she's starting to move a little bit again. The, the sense of hearing is one of the first things to come back, so that's how she'll start to perceive her environment again. But... You just get the feeling it won't be long before she wakes up. But it's an odd feeling to be holding a wild badger. You can feel a little heart beating away. Now, although we may think of badgers as woodland creatures, they really thrive in our open patchwork landscape. They can construct their sets in the hedgerows and there's endless foraging for all the worms and grubs they need. The man responsible for the actual trapping is Dinny Foley. His local knowledge is essential so that the traps are placed in exactly the right spot. Now he allows the badgers to get used to the cages for a couple of weeks before the team arrives. But only actually sets them when they do. They're easily caught when the time comes. Quite some ground is covered over the course of a day. Badger's vital statistics have never been gathered on such a scale before. And the zoology department in Trinity is a partner in collating all this information. 
Long-term studies like these are essential if you really want to fully understand an animal population and how it interacts with its environment. We have to make sure that the collar is not on too tight because the badger will grow during the summer, so we have to leave it some room to be able to expand a little bit into the collar size. We also don't want to have it on too loose or she'll just get it off. It seems that every badger we've come across this morning has its own story. She's got cataracts and unfortunately she's actually got cataracts in both eyes and that's where um, the lens, instead of being clear and see-through, becomes cloudy and hers are actually completely opaque so they're white. She would have very limited vision at all. So we're not going to collar her because it just seems like too much of an imposition when she's clearly blind. I suppose badgers don't use their eyes that much compared to their nose and their That's right, their senses. senses but yeah, sense of smell and their sense of hearing will more than make up for the um, loss of eyesight. One gets the feeling that the team have a real sense of respect and compassion for the subjects of their study. The information that these colours have sent back in the last few years has been revealing and has really added to our knowledge of Irish badgers. This farmyard is in the middle of the study area and I reckon most of the badgers living around here have had a collar on at some stage and over the years they have sent back thousands of positions from their nocturnal wanderings. So whereabouts are we on this? We have a satellite map here and we're in this farmyard here. We're standing in this shed right here. Each of these little collared icons is an individual badger hit, as it were, and that's where the collar has linked up with the satellites, and it's telling us that this is where the badger was at that time on that day. And have you got data from previous years as well? Um, yeah, we do, actually. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> this is a, yeah, this is a very busy map because this is four years worth of data um, and we have a lot of hits in all the fields and the woodland around. But I had always been under the impression that badgers spent a reasonable amount of time in farmyards, maybe coming in search of food and that sort of thing. But it looks to me like there isn't a single hit that's within right. this farmyard. Yeah, and that's a really interesting finding. Um, this isn't just a random thing that they didn't choose to go in here because you can see they've covered an awful lot of the surrounding area. Um, and that's something that we've been looking at. So in one particular study involving 40 badgers, um, we had 31,000 GPS positions for them. And what showed up was consistently all the badgers avoided going into farmyards. If they did go into a yard, it was more likely to be a horse yard or a disused yard and they all consistently avoided going into yards on cattle farms. That was a most unexpected finding. Is it possible that the badgers are coming through this farmyard and into these sheds but their colours can transmit through the the roofs of the buildings? Yeah, we wondered that as well. So when we were putting collars on badgers, we actually would leave collars in sheds overnight just to see would they send signals. And they can. They, can, they, can, they have linked up and can link up with the satellites through shed roofs. These are wild, free-ranging badgers, a standard population. There isn't anything special about them. It's just that they're wearing collars and they're sending us signals remotely. They're doing all that hard work for us and they're sending it to us by emails and text messages. So they choose where they go. And they don't come here? They don't come into yards. That's remarkable. That really is remarkable. Now, of course, Teresa has come across the occasional badger in a yard. But it seems to be very much the exception rather than the rule. And it's sort of like seeing a hedgehog in daylight. Could well mean that there's something wrong with it. It's not normal. Now the colours have told us that there were badgers foraging in this field last night. But what's really interesting is that they were just confined to this narrow strip. And this is a pattern that the data has shown repeatedly over the years. 
This is a big field, but it's divided into paddocks by electric fencing. And what's really interesting is that we've got cattle on this side, cattle on that side, no cattle in here. And this is one of the things that the study has shown up, that badgers will actively avoid going into fields where there are cattle. So when they go out in their nightly wanderings and they find that there are cattle in the field, they'll divert off somewhere else. And even if that's one of their preferred foraging areas, they'll still decide, OK, it's best to avoid it. And this is one of the mysteries that we'd like to unravel. And hopefully over the next few months and years, we'll start figuring out those um, pieces of the jigsaw. Now there's just one more badger to be released today. He continually ends up in the traps. It seems that he just cannot resist peanuts. Everyone is quite sure I'll find him there today. And it looks like he's there all right. Billy here, I think he's fallen asleep. He's either sleeping or sort of pretending to be asleep. And it's almost as if he's lying there with his eyes partially closed, thinking, if I can't see you, you can't see me. The one thing I've learned today is that all those things I'd heard about badgers, you know, how sort of aggressive they are and vicious they are, they're just simply not true. They're incredibly passive creatures that do their best to avoid us. Time to let him go. And no, he's not going to grab my leg until he hears the sound of my bone snapping. He's just heading home. Now, male badger territories are sizable, often hundreds of acres. But I know exactly where Billy is going. His collar starts sending out signals from one particular area as soon as he comes above ground every night. And so I'm heading there hoping to get a look at his set. Now Billy doesn't need a massive territory in order to provide enough food for himself. The reason he defends such a large area is that there's a reasonable chance that he'll have several females living within it. There's no way I could have found this in a million years if it wasn't for those little magic collars. So you wouldn't have an idea where to even start looking. There's several holes around. Looks like some of them are abandoned. That's often the way you get to a badger setting. You might think initially, oh, there's no one living here. But if you keep looking around, although there may be some holes which are no longer used, you tend to find a couple of active ones at least. And obviously, he's here someplace, so they must be active. This has been used all right. That's all the bedding. Badgers love bringing in bedding and they'll bring that down into the holes, keep themselves nice and cozy. And then after a while, they get rid of it and change it for some more. So anyone who says that badgers are sort of dirty creatures, they're not. They tend to keep themselves really nice and clean. Wonder if Billy's down there now. I'm gonna go and have a look around the rest of his territory. See what he gets up to at night. Now it seems that Billy regularly walks along this side of the hedgerow. Now that may well be because this is a border between one territory and another. And he has to come here often to let the other badgers know that he's still in the area. Ah, that's what I was looking for. Now this is one of Billy's latrines. And it's like a little messaging system. So it'll tell the other badgers in the area that he's been here recently, so other dominant males that might border his territory will come by here and they will know that Billy's still around. So it's a signal for them to sort of stay away. Other members of his clan will also use this. 
and uh, you can tell someone was here last night because there's quite a strong scent coming from it. Now, it's pretty amazing to think that once upon a time his territory was 720 hectares, they reckon. So that's about, I don't know, 1,600 acres or something like that. And uh, if he's wandering around the outside of that doing these, that was quite a job. Quite a job. But now that he's a slightly older badger, his territory isn't quite so big. But he'll still have to come here regularly to just tell the other badgers in the area that he's in town. This is my patch. Stay away. But within a couple of weeks of my visit, Billy's collar stopped sending signals. It just sent a final one. It's something the team always dreads. It's a mortality signal. Now the collars have a secondary locating system that allow them to be found and retrieved. But they weren't hearing anything. They looked in all his old haunts, just couldn't find him. And they were about to call it a day when Teresa heard something. Just as we were about to give up, we suddenly picked up a really weak signal. And eventually that signal led us right to the river. Nobody could see anything, no black and white body, no bad smell or anything like that. Um, and I did actually say, look, we need to actually check, has he fallen into the river? And as we scanned the river, I suddenly noticed a shape. And sure enough, it was Billy's collar lying on the bottom of the river in about a foot of water. And when you picked up the collar, what did you find? When we picked it up, this is what we found. And you can see that the collar has been cut off Billy using a really sharp knife. So it looks like Billy didn't die naturally? No, this was definitely an unnatural end. We always knew we'd see Billy and never expected to see this day when he ain't around anymore. So why would someone want to harm Billy? Well, badgers are known to carry TB. It's a disease that causes absolute havoc for farmers when it appears in their herd. But the relationship between TB in badgers and cattle is not understood. Other animals, like deer, carry TB too. But the powers that be are convinced that the way forward is to kill badgers. But Billy's death left a hole. Within six days, a new male had moved right in around Billy's territory. Now, after about 12 days of him being in the new territory, he was crossing a road that he wouldn't normally cross, and he got hit by a car. So he was killed. So we now have two dominant males gone out of the picture. Um, but we still had three collared males, and it's caused huge social disruption. Males that never came across each other before are coming across each other here in Billy's place, and it's certainly a point of contact that they wouldn't normally have. Since the 1980s, we have killed tens of thousands of badgers, and government policy is to kill thousands more this year. In England, the powers that be were utterly convinced that killing badgers was the only way forward, until they appointed an independent scientific panel to assess all the evidence. They came to the conclusion that killing badgers didn't work. Why? Possibly because it led to mass badger movements. So surely our badgers deserve an independent scientific panel too. They are supposedly a protected animal, after all. Next week, I'm going underwater to film grey seals in Dublin Bay and heading west to meet their close cousins. This Thursday at 7, Dermot Bannon leaves behind his day job on Room to Improve and goes into the great outdoors and enjoys part of the wild Atlantic way for tracks and trails. Next tonight, EastEnders.